For much of his long career, he was derided as the Madden who couldn't play. A seemingly uncoordinated 206 centimetre bundle of arms and legs. In truth, he was a lot more than Simon Madden's unfashionable younger brother. Justin Madden played 332 games, played in two premiership teams, won two Best and Fairies awards and was runner-up in a Brownlow. You conned us, Justin, you could actually play. I think you've been pretty harsh calling me unfashionable, Michael. Well, there's about five things here you could there complain about. There are a lot of things. There are a lot of, there are a lot of, but I think unfashionable is pretty harsh. Like, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a fashion icon, but I wasn't completely, you know, a mess. Some of us would say you made an art form of tomfoolery. Well, some, some could say that. Yeah, you yeah, are just a, a footballer that sort of uh, liked to enjoy themselves, Michael, and I still do. Did you love it? Not necessarily. No, there were moments I really enjoyed, but most of the time it was pretty hard work, Michael. So the only way to get through that is to sort of make light of it and entertain yourself a bit. But you didn't train, you didn't go to club functions. Uh, well, I did, but not to the extent that some of my teammates might have. You know, I, I, I was never keen on club functions, and when we had official club functions, I had a little technique that used to get me out early where I'd leave the car headlights on, and they'd make an announcement, of course, uh, you know, somebody's <laughs> left their headlights on, they better go out and turn them off, and I'd go out and get in the car and go home. <laughs> now, there's never been any pretense about you, but... Uh, well, I couldn't. You know, I, you can only work with the material you've got, and I was slow and tall. And the reason why I had a long career, Michael, really, was I couldn't get any shorter, and it was impossible to get any slower. Mm. So, uh, you know, that, that can give you a long career if you're a ruckman. But then, recently I met you for a cup of coffee, yeah, and you hand me your business card, yeah. and it's got the Honourable Justin Madden AM. Yeah. Well, it's... And I nearly fell over when you gave me that. Like, because I gave you something? Or <laughs> was the fact that you just... The, the, what was on it? Well, you know, the, 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 uh, it's a surprise to most people. That's why I, I do like to give that card away, just to remind people that, um, you know, in it, on occasions, I can be serious. But you're out of Parliament. Would you retain that title for life, do you? I, oh, something like that. Like, I, I haven't thought too long and hard about it, but apparently you can, I think. Mm, OK. Lots of fond memories about your career, for me, and ge I'm genuine about that. That's good. Uh, well, you're showing your age and my age, too. Well, that's OK. I can live with that. What, you're only fi in your 50s? Yeah, yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We won't go into detail, but yeah. <laughs> and you're not, you're, not, you're not as young as you used to be. No, but I'm not in my 50s, terrific, no. Michael. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> I want to take you back to Waverley Park in 1993. Yes. The final, Carlton are playing Adelaide. Yes. The ball happens to fall into your hands. Yeah, yeah. You look up towards goal. Yep. Pick the story up from there. Well, it was, uh, it, it was a final that we were behind in. It was, I think this was just before half-time. And it's funny because David Parker had give us the instruction that if you get the ball and you bounce it, you've upset the whole system so much you may as well have a shot for goal. I was running and I was looking to give it away to our teammates because I'm not supposed to run and bounce the ball. But Adelaide must have had a man up sort of game plan. So th as I ran, all our running players peeled off to get a handball and their Adelaide opponents followed them. Went with so them. they just opened the water, you know, part of the waters for yeah. me and I just ran down the field. And, you know, you're running, you've got to keep bouncing it. So I did. And then I looked up thinking I could kick it to Stephen Kernahan, but he had run so far up the ground by this stage because it had taken me so long to get there, the ball just bounced through for a goal. Now, I liked the follow-up. You kept running towards yes. the, uh, the Carlton throng. I did well. It was and blew kisses to them. Well, it was one of the few occasions... Uh, like, it, it was a discernible laughter in the crowd. It's not very often you hear that. Like, you can hear the boos and the cheers and a bit of static, but not much else. So I could hear the laughter and I could see the irony, as most of the crowd could. And so, you know, you take the opportunities when you can, so blew a few kisses on the way back. And I think if you look at the footage, even my teammates are, are chuckling. They're laughing at it too. But, but when, in my research on you, which yeah. took me a long, long time, yeah. um, you kicked five goals in your first game for the Blues after leaving Essendon. And, and in fact, kicked 190 goals for your career. You know, yeah. I, not to put too fine a point on it, but you were I was surprised. staggered when I you read that. You were staggered. Yeah. So obviously, you obviously didn't pay much attention to me, Michael, <laughs> throughout the course of my career. But that's not a bad thing. That's all right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So five goals in your first game for the Blues. I did, yeah, yeah, which was handy, but I didn't yeah. kick too many in a hurry after that. Yeah. So you left Essendon after four years. Four years, yeah. Was that because your brother Simon had the mortgage on the number one ruck spot? No, no, not, not really. I, I, the only place to play me was in the ruck. Yeah. Simon could play. Simon was, you know, great athlete. 
uh, great ruckman, great forward. And so he was sort of being played between the two positions I was being played in the ruck. And we're both being paid half as much money as we probably should have earned. Uh, my, my contract ended and I thought, oh, well, here's a chance for us both to sort of cement ourselves in the position we want and probably get paid what we deserve. So I went looking for another club and ended up at Carlton. So was there, were you uncomfortable playing with your brother or not? No, 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 it was good. It was, it was good. You, you know, if you had a choice to kick it to somebody, you'd always kick it to your brother yeah. first. He, in my view, yeah. it's a layman, layman's yes. view, he was the best ruckman forward in no the doubt. time I've been watching. For no him. doubt, no doubt. And often underestimated, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. I think sometimes I'm overestimated, but he was certainly <laughs> underestimated. Model. Tell me about how you in, would describe yourself. You know, I was probably yes. harsh on you in the intro about... Yeah. Um, oh, no, I think you've fair. It was just the unfashionable bit. <laughs> why, are you so, why do you care so much about that? Oh, well, I, you know, I, I take great pride in my appearance, Michael. <laughs> you can only work with the material you've got, but, you know, this is uh, the material i got. All right, let me pose this yes. situation for you. You're 206 centimetres tall. Yeah, I used to be. Yes. I don't know if I still am. The weight of the world can wear you down, <laughs> bit, Michael. You're running out in number 44 Four, on your back. Yeah. And it's a big uh, number too. It's it a lot was a to big carry, yeah. 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 And it, it's also, I, they gave it to me at Eston. I kept it at Carlton and I continued to keep it because it was a reminder to people that, too. Like, they did offer me another number at various stages. But it was, you know, I just wanted to remind them that you thought I was worth 44 <laughs> when you put me on the list. I'm still 44 and I'm still here. Was there, a, was there a significant Carlton number that was offered to you? No, it was probably the point. You know, it was maybe 20 numbers down, but it wasn't much better, really, was it? <laughs> All right, now, the unfashionable part. We, we've yeah. established that... You... We don't have to go on about it. No, no, it, no, Mike. but I want to just pose this uh, yes. specific yeah. day to you. Uh, when you uh, ran out on the ground yeah. wearing a helmet. I did, yes. I wore a helmet because the week... And I, I don't think the coach received it very well either. So, David Park, and I remember in the uh, aftermatch... Uh, he, he used to write these written after-match reports, go into great detail about statistics and all sorts of things. And one of the lines in it was, Harry, I never want to see that helmet again. Mm. Uh, and he didn't. But the point being that uh, the week before, I was involved in Mark of the Year, but unfortunately it was Peter Bazusto <laughs> taking the Mark of the Year on my head, and he knocked me out. But the point being there was no other opponent around us when he took it. So it was sort of a bit of a statement like, I do have a very sore head here, and uh, if you didn't pick it up last week, I still got a sore head this week. So when you pulled the helmet on, yes. were you self-conscious at all, or, were you, or was it you taking? Look, the I, I was probably self-conscious for most of my career, Michael. If you look <laughs> at this body and the way it operates, it's, you know, there's no point in letting that hold you back, though. So I wasn't too self-conscious about it, but uh, uh, it was uh, more, more, more saying to uh, my teammates, you know. I'm a bit more delicate than you might think I am. <laughs> but the other point was, I think it was Lee Richards who said the only thing that Justin Mend uh, seems to have to worry about when it comes to his head is low-flying jumbo jets or something like that. <laughs> There's a piece of furniture at Carlton in the medical room. The H. Madden Memorial Bed. Yes. Yeah. What's the origin of that? Well, I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, I probably spent more time on that than I did on the field, actually, Michael. But, you know... To, you know, to the credit of the medical staff at the Carlton Football Club, it allowed me to have a, a long, a much longer career than probably most others. And uh, I was very keen on um, recuperation. Uh, and uh, I think we were always asked to do extras, and I would always ask to do more recuperation. Which spent <laughs> that was your extra? More, yeah, my extra was more recuperation. Were you ever injured when you were occupying that bed? Oh, no, but I was preventing injury, Michael. <laughs> You know, I was always very big on, on preparation like and running. Like so, that. you know. You were a practical joker in the footy club, weren't you? Well, you've got to do something. It's pretty, you know, they can be pretty dull places in the middle of winter when you're not winning. So, uh, and even when you're winning, they can still be dull places. So, you've got to entertain yourself as much as your teammates. And if teammates don't get you a joke, it doesn't matter really. What about when Parco decided that you would simulate the conditions for a night game, an upcoming well, he did. night game, and you went to yeah. the showground? We did, yeah. So, so. David Parkin is a great man of football science, decided that we would train at the time we were going to play a game. So I think we were playing games at 8 o'clock or quarter past 8 at night. Uh, and it was very early days. So he decided we would train at quarter past 8 at the showgrounds. And mind you, we still worked in those days. So we worked or we, we went to you know, uh, uni or something. And so he had us training at a quarter past 8, which was a really inconvenient time. And by the time we finished, it was close to 10 o'clock. So I thought, you know, just to, just to make a point, uh, 
when we all got changed out and you shouting out of our, out of our footy gear, I, I just put my pyjamas straight on and my dressing gown <laughs> and you know, gave them a wave so I'm just cutting out the middleman here, I'm going straight to bed. <laughs> Did the wheels turn at different times? Did you find your car on blocks one night? Yeah, I think it might have been on my birthday too. I'd, I'd, uh, the misfortune, I had to go to the tribunal. And so when I came back from the tribunal, with, I might have had a, got a week suspension too, so I wasn't in the best of moods, only to find that Peter Dean and a few other characters had put my car on blocks and then padlocked my wheels to the staircase at Carlton. So, I, you know, it, it took me a while to get home that night. I think you're still finishing credit, according to your teammates. Yeah. You're talking about the tribunal, Justin. Did you whack Michael Tuck in the 87 grand final? Oh, I may have come into contact with a lot of players like that over my career, Michael, but of course it was never, never ever intentional. Cause no I, malice? I, no, never any malice. And if I ever injured any blokes from coming into contact or high contact, it was, it was always an apology offered immediately afterwards, Michael. Can I ask you once more? <laughs> Did you deliberately whack Michael Tuck to the head in the grand final? Well, there may be some footage that shows that. <laughs> were, you, were, you, were you suspended for that? I think I was, yeah, a yeah. couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I wasn't as nice as you make me out to be. What about your relationship with Parco? It was pa all, yeah. Parco, uh, it was interesting. Is uh, it? Yours, your, your relationship with him. Yeah, no, the Parco's a great man, a and great coach. feisty? Oh, no, I wouldn't say feisty. I think I probably frustrated him. But I was always, you know, I was always, I, I was great admirer of David. I think I won best and fairest under David and probably performed better under David than our other coaches. And uh, I just liked the way he went about it. Um, although, you know, he's a very sort of scientific, formulaic, uh, and, and also, you know, the, a bit of traditional fire and brimstone. So I think sometimes that didn't work to the extent that he would have liked it. To work on me because I probably was a bit more laid back when he was giving the big, you know, proverbial fire and brimstone speech. But um, no, we got on very well, and, and uh, I, 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 if anything, I probably frustrated him, but I found him great because he also had a view that football was a part of your life, but it wasn't your whole life. Mm. You, well, that was your view, wasn't it? It was always my view. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I, I could tell that I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't a natural athlete, so football wasn't going to come naturally. So I couldn't, uh, I couldn't. Uh, bank on it entirely, so I had to have other things in my life. But, he, but when you say that, I mean, you played for 17 seasons, didn't you? Oh, something. But who's counting, Michael? But that's a long it's time. It's a long time, yeah. A long time in a game that you, you never mastered. No, no. In your words, right. that you never yeah, mastered. No, no, yeah, no, I'm quite happy, you know. You just, I was uh, tall, slow, uncoordinated, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and unfashionable. Just, unfashionable as well, so I've got another one there. <laughs> so all I had to do was just hit the ball to people. And sometimes I wasn't much good at that either. Well, you often know that you, now you're being self-deprecating yeah, right. to a ridiculous extent. Parco said there was a three-year period yeah. in which Carlton outscored every team in the competition yes. for goals from centre clearances. There you go. So, so you have been paying attention. <laughs> no, he told me that. No, that was good. I'm glad he remembers that too. But I mean, that's a, you, your hands were very good. I mean, you had a head start, I must say, standing at two. Well, I couldn't jump. I, like I couldn't jump that much. I could jump a bit, but you know, I had a long reach, and I was probably the tallest going around. So, mm. I'd want to be able to get that head first to the ball. You never cared, days. though, did you, about your image? You were happy. You well, dress up no, as a dinosaur, well, and you would do odd things. Yeah, I'd do. You know, if the media wanted me to do something silly, I'd do it. They had a job to do and I had a job to do. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was always quite happy to entertain them and myself and make people laugh, you know. Because I, remembering, you know, there was a period of time when I would... I, I remember I'd, I'd sit in the in the, uh, the coaches' room sometimes. I'd be sitting next to Anthony Kutafides and these other players who were all, you know, ribbed and built. And, and I'd think, you know, I'm great, I'm one of these blokes. <laughs> you know, I'm an athlete. And then I'd, you know, I'd watch the replay and I'd think, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Nor have I ever been. <laughs> Your locker was next to Cooter's. It was next to Cooter's, so he was did 43. You get, yeah, did you get the same amount of fan mail as Cooter? No, no, no. So Cooter's number 43 and I was number 44, and Cooter would get, uh, he'd get fan mail in those days, you know, like there's no tomorrow, and it, you'd get these cute little letters from young ladies saying nice things about him and to him, and then he'd get them on a regular basis, and I'd open my locker and I'd, once or twice a year I'd get one, and it was always written in copper plate, you know, the old <laughs> script, but it'd be some lady in her 80s saying nice things to me. How was Parco with your antics, you know, when you would sort of pretend to hide behind people, one of whom was Anthony Rock, who goes up to your hip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, you know, sometimes it, it, if the ball's rushed out of the back line 
And I, if I wasn't as deep as I should have been, I'd just sort of crouch down and hopefully they'd kick one in my direction. And occasionally it worked. It didn't work very often, but it did work occasionally. So I think, yeah, there was one famous moment where I crouched behind Anthony Rock, you know, <laughs> Rock which was, you know, hiding behind a rock. Did you? Uh, as opposed that to would have been deliberate. Career. Now, I'm a bit confused by this. Yes. Your last senior game was 1996. Yes, that's right. But you played several games the next year. In the reserves. In the reserves. Now, that's Parco right. said to me that you said you were never going to play reserves football. No, I never said that. I'd played a fair bit of reserves footy. But he said to me, I think, in that meeting, he said, uh, I remember the meeting at the end of the season, he obviously wanted me to go. But I... the footy. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. You know, he thought it, my career had finished. Yeah. But he didn't say that in those words. So I was trying to get him to say it, but he wouldn't say it. So I said, well, look, if you want to sack me or delist me, go ahead. Go ahead. And I thought it maybe there's an unfair dismissal claim there if I <laughs> wanted it. But they wouldn't do it. So I, I fronted up again and played in the reserves for about, oh, eight or nine games and thought, this'll do me. You know, I'm not going anywhere. There's a, there's a popular theory at Carlton, shared by many, mm -hmm. that... Uh, Have I heard this before? Well, I think you're familiar with it. Yeah. That um, Carlton were ready to move you on or perhaps suggest to you, to you that you should go. Yeah. And John Elliott vetoed that. Idea. Could well have been the case. I remember John Elliott's young daughter, Alexandra, I think her name was, uh, turned up when she was a young girl. She had, uh, she came into the rooms after the game, we're sitting on the benches in our outfits, and she had a, a dinosaur, a little fluffy dinosaur on her arm. Somebody said, see that big bloke over there? Uh, he's a dinosaur, go over and talk to him. <laughs> so she came back the next week with a duffel coat with number 44 on the back, uh, which was quite flattering, but I, I continued to remind John Elliott there was no possible way I could get the sack because he couldn't break his daughter's heart. <laughs> so I reckon I got a couple of years out of worked? that. I think it worked, yeah. I got a couple of extra years, I'm sure. <laughs> Do you ever reflect on the fact that two boys who grew up in Airport West ended up playing 710 games between them? I mean, it's a staggering... Feet that? Yeah, yeah. I don't think about those things too long and hard, Michael. It's just you just turn up and do what you do. And um, I don't think it was remarkable that Simon played that much footy, but I think it's pretty remarkable that I did. You know, because <laughs> he, he was an athlete. He was he was a junior sprinter, a champion sprinter. He was a junior high jump champion. Yep, yep. Great footballer. And I was just tall. You know, I was just a bit taller. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I wasn't any of those things. So he, he was. You know, he was destined to be one. You know, I probably fluked it and hung on for a long time. I did the first story on your brother, so... I know, yes, I remember that. So you were a household name in, in our in family. The family. Yeah, yeah, like that Mike Sheen. You know him, and we all knew you. <laughs> I'm flattered, mate, I'm yeah. flattered. Yeah. But yeah. mind you, that was a long time ago, Mike. <laughs> and we've moved on from That's that. Right. Now, did you enjoy playing on your brother? Oh, always. It was always hard, hard work, because he could run and I had to keep up with him. But I, I thought if I could uh, keep up with him to a point that I could probably outreach him, so it was always a, always a fair and reasonable contest. Was it physical? Uh, not too much, although I think there was one game down at Eston where uh, we'd been at Eston together in practice matches and I knew if he ran off, I, I couldn't catch up with him. So I would grab his shorts as he started to move away and pull his shorts down. So <laughs> that would give me a couple of seconds to keep up with him. And I did that when the first time Carlton played Eston at Windy Hill. And uh, with that, he turned around and, 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 and uh, located his hand in... in in a part of my shorts, so which shall remain nameless, and uh, it gave me a bit of a shock, mm. so I belted him uh, across really? the chest. Not yeah. nothing yeah. savage, but yeah. across the chest, and, and the umpire gave a free kick against me for doing that. So I, I gave the, the umpire a, a quite a mouthful. I said, please stay out of domestic disputes. <laughs> which is hey, now, in a technical sense, how did you contend with Ruckman of the, the athleticism of Wren, Barnes, Rendell, McKernan? That, those yeah, they were all athletic, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I think, I think uh, it was all about positioning, Michael. It's about where you locate yourself between the Ruckman and the ball. So yeah. it's, not, it's not rocket science. No, but I'm not talking necessarily about the centre square. Yeah. I'm talking about around the ground. Yeah. I mean, they could run off you, couldn't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, they could all run off me. There wasn't yeah. a Ruckman in the league who couldn't <laughs> run off me. And if they, if they couldn't run off me, there was something dreadfully wrong with them, <laughs> my God. But I, I would... Uh, uh, over, the, over the course of my career, I worked out that it's a bit like endurance runners. You, you actually have a bigger base and more endurance the more seasons you put in. And uh, I had more endurance because I just played in the ruck longer than most of these blokes. So and you didn't train though? No, because I'd run, work so hard on a set day, Michael, I had to recover and do extra recovery during the week. So I would, um, I would just run all day long. And I said, so in those days we rucked all day. Or I rucked, mm -hmm. not many ruckmen rucked all day in those days, but I rucked all day. And uh, I'd just keep going. And um, most of them 
would fall away after all. I'd stay close to them and not let them get away. And then um, I'd just keep, just keep going. So I was you know, a bit of an ox, you know. Just keep going. Did you ever get angry on the field? Where you, where you, that oh, laid-back attitude? Yeah, yeah, but, you know, I couldn't follow through with it most of the time, Michael. You know, I'd get angry and pick somebody up and throw them or, or I'd, you know, throttle them, but not much, you know. There, wasn't, there was never going to be much follow-up on my part. I was never going to be fast enough, you know. So, uh, you know, it was a, part, of, part, of, part of football is the theatrics. You've got to give people the impression that you're nastier than you, you are. You think that it's a bit homogenised today, don't you? Well, I think they could loosen up a bit, you know. Everyone's very formulaic in terms of their responses to the media and when they get out there, you know, we always get the same. They make great politicians, these people, because they stick to the party line, mm. you know. Whereas um, they should just relax a bit and be themselves. You know, I'd love it, give me an example. I mean, if someone I'd love just... to see one of them get out there one day and just say, when, you know, said, you played really well today. I'd love one of them to say, yeah, wasn't I fantastic today? Oh, terrific, you know, and, and give them the thumbs up or something. But no, they're all, you know, they're all very well drilled and they don't. They don't step outside that sort of that team line, which is a bit of a shame, really. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you about that. Two years after your footy career, you mentioned politics before. Yes. You enter politics to the surprise of many of us. Yes. 1999. To, even to the surprise of myself, Michael. Really. <laughs> so, and uh, I hadn't. I, I had been involved in the Players Association for which seven was, years. Yeah. yeah, which players. You play as union, and we went through a fairly tumultuous time where we went through um, the league introduced the salary cap, the draft, and the standard player contract. And I, you know, this was all news to me, so I had to go and talk to people in the labour movement and find out what this all meant and what I need to do. And we we ran a campaign, and we sorry before you leave that, we survived that. Who did you seek counsel from? Uh, oh, Bill Kelty and yeah. John Halfpenny and some of the old union stalwarts of, yeah. of the day, and then. Um, as part of that goodwill, I joined the Labor Party and helped them out on a few things, but never expecting anything more than that. And then um, just before the 99 election, yes. That looked like you were enjoying that. Yeah, time. I'm having a terrific time there, aren't I? A bit <laughs> like now, Michael. But, uh, but uh, uh, 99 election, somebody came up to you just before it. Jeff Kennett was about to announce, you know, do you think you might uh, be interested in the seat? We might have a seat available on short notice. One of the candidates can't run. Um, and... Uh, I said, when do you need an answer by? And this was over coffee in the morning. I, they said, oh, about three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> so I, I said yes, but I went home, you know, discussed at home, and we said, yeah, yes. So I said, let them know it's yes. And then, I, But my expectation was I would be nominating for the upper house, which is where I went, uh, the back bench in opposition. So I thought, that can't be too hard, because I'll be able to learn. Um, and then about 12... Weeks later, I was a minister in the upper house, mm. minister for sport. So it was as much a shock to me as it was to anybody else. That day was memorable for two things, I reckon. Yeah. Um, Labor won the election. That's right. And Carlton beat, beat Eston, Eston in the preliminary group. final. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so the underdogs got up on both occasions. Yeah. Yes. Now, what happened when they came to you and sort of said, now, Justin, you're now a member of parliament. You haven't been here for long, but we're going to make you a minister. Well, you don't say no to that, and I don't. Yeah. Did you have any idea though what what was? No, what no, I didn't know what that meant, Michael. But it was a great thing as you learn on the run, um, and uh, you know every day was a new experience. Uh, it was a learning experience, and um, you just hold your breath and hang on. And I hang on for a long time, a bit like I'd played footy. So in both both careers, I didn't expect much. <laughs> the Brownlow Medal, Justin. Yes. Would you have felt that you were sort of, uh, belonged on the honour board? Had you? Uh, uh, one, got two more votes and beaten Brad Hardy? No, no, no. I don't think that was a very good year for football, Michael. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, look, I was very fortunate. I think that was the second time I'd taken my wife out, really. So oh, she, the Brownlow night? Yeah, it was the yeah. Brownlow night. I thought I'd, I'd make a big impression mm -hmm. on her, so it's the second time I took her out. What and, did you say? And I, in the car on the way there, I said, I, I might get a few votes tonight. And then as the votes accumulated, you know, the cameras were on us and the lights were on us, and I thought, oh, God, this is a bit nerve-wracking for both of us. Because I thought... It's very early days here because mm. there'll be family members watching, yeah. there'll be friends watching. Were they aware of the courtship? Well, I think they were, they were aware that we were going to the Brownlow together. So, but, of course, if you win the Brownlow, you know, the big statement is yeah. your partner. You know, do you, yeah. you know, big hug or a, you know... Front page of the Herald Sun. Yeah, that's right. So I was a bit worried about, you know, whether, whether uh, I should you know, lay a big passionate kiss <laughs> or just a peck on the cheek. I didn't know where, where I was going to go with it because that would be interpreted by a lot of people around us who knew us very well. Yes. And then at the, I think the last two votes or something, you know, the votes fell away and I didn't get there and the cameras raced off and, and went over to Brad Hardy. Yeah. And it was to great relief.
Michael, because I thought now I don't have to worry about it. I can believe that. Yeah, think, yeah, great relief it was. For so it was only his second date. It was. I think it was our second date. Yeah. So I was greatly relieved that. Uh, and of course, you know, we've been married all these years, so I feel like I got the award I wanted. Oh, very <laughs> nice, Justin. <laughs> That's a great moment. You with Stephen Silvani with long hair. Yeah, yeah. With very long hair he's got there, hasn't he? But yeah, no, there's a great moment. And being able to share that and uh, you know have all those supporters, uh, you know, really feel. As excited as you are is a great moment. It's what you play footy for, really, I suppose. Did you blow any kisses that day? There's, there's a bloke that we both admire for his... Uh, yes. Uh, ..for his football ability and the fact he's a, he's a genuinely funny man, Diesel, he isn't is he? He's a funny man. He hardly said a word during our football career. Like, he'd tell me where to hit the ball and I'd hit it there. And that was about all we ever said to each other. <laughs> but um, since he's finished playing footy, you, you can't shut him up. Mm. So uh, he's the funniest man I've ever met. But The funniest I, I, man you've ever yeah, met? Yeah, only... But since... Yeah. Since... The end of his football career. Yeah. He, wasn't very, he was always very serious playing footy. The 95 Premiership team, lots of big names. Yeah. Where does it sit among the great teams that you've seen in, the, say, the last 30 years? Starting from Hawthorne yeah. in the 80s. I haven't watched that much footy in the last no. 30 years, Michael. Really? I know it's a silly question. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I haven't watched Only in recent years have I watched. I was busy in politics. I couldn't watch too much footy. But, um, uh, oh, it's a great team. But... You know, every, every team's a great team that wins a premiership yeah. for various reasons. You know, I, I, I've enjoyed some of the, the more recent grand finals because I've had a chance to relax and enjoy them. But, uh, uh, you know, I, th I think every premiership t side has a story behind it too, which galvanises those players to achieve what they achieve. And, and whenever you hear about those stories, they're always great and they're worth, they're worth listening to as well. What are you doing these days, the Honourable Justin Madden AM? <laughs> I've gone back to working in the field I originally trained in, which is architecture. So I work for a company called Arup, who are an engineering design consultancy. Um, and that, that keeps me busy. So you, do you miss an active involvement in footy at all, be it ruck coach, commentator, whatever? No, not, no, not really. No, no, I enjoy watching it from a distance and being an armchair critic. But no, I think like a lot of things in your life, there's a period of time which you invest your, your energy and your emotion and have a go at it. And, uh, and then there's a point at which you, you leave it behind and move on. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to do that with football and politics and, and still have a nice, you know, uh, nice things that I can be passionate about and work in as well. Justin, I didn't mean to call you unfashionable. <laughs> Simon Thomas. No, no I, think, I, I think you're probably right. But I, I can see these socks. I don't know if you can see these socks. <laughs> Yeah, this, no, is a man who's, this, is a, this is a man who's calling me unfashionable. And look at those socks. <laughs> They're not fashionable? Well, I don't know, because I wouldn't know, <laughs> no, would you I? Wouldn't no, exactly. <laughs> now, look, look, despite that, I, uh, that was a tease. Um, yep. Of course, you're entirely extremely proud of what you've done. And I, I think the family, as I said before, 700 games for the two of you, monumental achievement. We enjoyed watching you play because you were a distinctive character uh, and you've got plenty to show for it. Nice to see you, Justin. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Michael.